welcome back to uh, our third and final panel discussion uh, at this latest edition of ABLF Talks. Thank you very much indeed to all those uh, out there in the ABLF city at the moment. Another opportunity for you to send your thoughts through to us now. You can tweet at ABLF or drop in your requests, your thoughts, your feedback on Instagram and LinkedIn. So please make sure you get them into us. As you see, we have an all-star cast to wrap things up with uh, the panel that we are going to close with. UN SDGs, a greater urgency with higher stakes. Absolute pleasure uh, to be joined on this final panel. Again, questions coming in from the city and also live from the floor in just a little while. Uh, just along to my left here, uh, we have none other than the founding partner of Soma Mater UAE, Sheikh Dr. Majid al Kasmi. Thank you so much indeed for being with us. Much appreciate your time uh, this afternoon. Welcome to Expo 2020 Dubai. Alongside you, sir, we have none other than the executive director of the CN Center for Biodiversity bringing a true, true uh, global perspective. Thank you very much indeed to Dr. Re Teresa Mundita Eslem. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Uh, alongside uh, uh, Mundita, along with us today as well, co-founder of the Possibilities Project, Eco Edition, uh, it is Dr. Tiffany Delport. Tiffany, thank you so much indeed for being with us. And very special guest at the end with us here today, uh, none other than the president of the Emirates Marine Environmental Group, uh, Major Ali Saka Sultan al Sawedi. Major al Sawedi, thank you so much indeed for being with us. Um, before we move on with a further introduction uh, to our panelists. I would like to just play a little video, if we can, to set the tone for the wider discussion about some of the extraordinary work that the Emirates Marine Environmental Group has been doing in recent years and for many, many years now here in the UAE, but across the region as a whole. Please have a look. Look. I love to do pearl diving, and that's why it's really my passion. In 71, the first dive in my life, I saw something really magic underwater. I love to see the seabed now. Many stories come from my grandfather and my father. When they do pearl diving, it's very hard, you know, to dive from sunrise until sunset with little food to eat. The first spell I saw in my life, it's amazing, you know, it's something you cannot believe it, it's, it's something natural. And you see how it's shining and beautiful. The children of Emirates, you know, they love their heritage and especially the pearl diving. To teach them heritage is it, like, you know, a big foundation for them for the future. The best thing we have in this life, you know, we have the sea. I hope always to be not far from the sea. Israeli was just telling us there, that's the 200,000. Uh, dirhams or dollars? Dirhams or dollars? Dirhams, okay, that's the 200,000 dirham one. Uh, Major Ali, thank you so much indeed for being with us. Um, that gives us just a little insight into some of the work, some of the extraordinary heritage, not just of the the region, but also the work that the Emirates Marine Environmental Group undertakes. Maybe you can explain to our guests here, but also the guests uh, across the globe at the moment, what your organization does. Uh, thank you very much, really, uh, to invite me. Uh, my name is uh, Ali Sagar Sultan Suedi. I am the president of Emirates Marine Environment Group and uh, the, uh, also uh, General Secretary of WWF and uh, you know my family is a pearl diving family and you know we start long long time with the, with the uh, pearls and with the oyster with the, the whole experience uh, you know we are as a MEG we start uh, in 1995 uh, as an NGO marine NGO and that's come uh, as a route you know from my family uh, because they s speak with me about you know the the marine and about how to protect the sea and it, it's amazing you know to come close you know when other, i am young you know i born on the beach on mm. in, in summer very hot summer <laughs> and my mother she took you know the better and she put on my skin uh, to make me alive you know and she threw my sir i don't know what you call it in english in the sea 
which is our traditional if they throw it in the sea you will be always you know connecting with the sea and that's happened now when i grow you know to 15 to 16 you know uh, you know Cousteau, the biggest uh, Cousteau from french you know he's yeah. with calypso he's like our gov uh, godfather and the chance come come to me to meet him in ras muhammad in sharm al sheikh and uh, you know i stay with him like more than 15 uh, days and he teach me really many things about uh, the environment and you know how to take care about the environment and how to make organization and long time you know i met him in 1988 and when i came uh, i start many organization like uh, emirates diving association the science club and the last one is uh, uh, you know meg 1995. Uh, the important thing you know for us as a meg you know we care about uh, the environment and the culture one of the ma amazing thing happened you know we are in charge of many uh, places in, in Emirates, like in Dubai, we have Jabal Ali uh, Reserve, in Abu Dhabi also Sir Benias in Sharjah, uh, with Sharjah environment in uh, Sir Benair Island. And this is which make us, you know, uh, taking the children, taking the school, taking the university to see the nature. You know, after the pill diving finished, everybody left, you know, the, uh, the sea. And now I want to return <laughs> back to the sea. That's where my job, you know. And we start really, you know, in uh, 71, the first journey from Dubai to the island, which we make it, uh, you know, call it Al Wasal journey. And it's amazing, you know, how to go and see, you know, the natural environment and, you know, show it to the new generation because, mm -hmm. you know, they are only uh, think about, you know, they have inf information more about England, about the United States. Because now when you speak about 200 islands in the MLS, they don't know not only three or four. And that's where my job, you know, to go and take photo. Uh, and it's happened sometime, you know, in uh, 76, where I'm going to the island, and we want to film in the water. And we couldn't because, you know, no camera in the water. Mm. I make my own <laughs> housing. And the TV, they gave me the, 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 the big camera. And I said, Major Ali is going, the water, it will be, you know, make a problem. I said, please trust me. Alhamdulillah, I succeed on uh, that uh, camera. And I make the first film for Dubai, uh, 1988. And I took big present from uh, Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, but I want to say really, you know, the before Expo start, <coughs> the uh, Dubai Tourism, they sent BBC to me mm. to make film for Expo. And I done two of this film and other film with a small boy. And that's the first film, you know. When they come, they told me, what's your idea? I said, look to show them Dubai before, like 50 years or 60 years, and Dubai now. Mm. And they agree, and mashallah, Sheikh Mohammed used it for the expo. And it's, uh, you know, getting many, uh, you know, uh, trophy on that uh, film. Uh, the important thing really, you know, which we look for, you know, people when they come to Emirat, we care about everybody, not just local. Now we, we invite, you know, the Boy Scouts, uh, the Girl Scouts, English, French, uh, German, Indian. When they come, you know, we teach them very important thing. We told them, you know, you're coming from one mother and one father. You have same blood. It means we are family. We, we, didn't, we didn't need to fight. We need to be uh, good people. We need to be l like Dubai. Mashallah, 200 nationality. And we are really love them. We care about them. And this is how Dubai built and Emirat built. And that's from Sheikh Mohammed. Yeah. S s you know, philosophy of Sheikh Mohammed is amazing. You know, in 1995, I done uh, a village, a heritage village. And he came to visit me before Burj Khalifa, before all that. And he's speaking about something, he cannot believe it. And I told him, Sheikh, this is going to happen? He said, yes. And it's happened. Yeah. Sheikh Mohammed is, is a great guy. Now when I came to Expo, this is the first day, <laughs> I shocked to see another weird hair. This is Dubai, this is Emirat, and this is the credit not for us only. The people who come here, you know, you see many nationality, how they support you know, and I believe these guys come, you know, from, they have a huge experience. 
and they bring it to Dubai, to Emirates. And this is the treasure. Mm. That's why I care about you know, their children, about their family. And I invite them in Jabal Ali uh, Reserve. We don't charge. The only place in Dubai where you don't charge, you, <laughs> 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 you will come free, you know, and you can plant mangrove, you can uh, do pearl diving. And, you know, the good thing also when the children are there is not allowed telephone. The telephone is off. <laughs> we don't let anybody speak because, uh, you know, it's important to listen to n nature. Mm. Nature is beautiful. Nature is have the nice thing. We need their, you know, the children to come and feel that. And this is why we can pass the for the new generation, you know, uh, to take care about the environment. And if you want, I can tell you one of the story of from my family. You know, my family is a pill diving family in Deira. And uh, the, the season, we have three month season mm. uh, to go pill diving. And when my grandfather, he have his uh, boat, they call it Al-Asad, Al-Asad mean the lion. Uh, he want <coughs> to go pill diving. And my father is very small, you know, like when you more than nine, they take you pill diving. Mm. Only the lady, they stay in, in Dubai. Yeah. And suddenly before he go, one Omani guy come and he's crying. <laughs> And my grandfather, why you cry? He said, I want to go pearl diving in Dubai. 400 boats go pearl diving. Nobody wants to take him because he don't know how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> so I will take you, you know. I cannot take you. He said, please, I have 30 people in Oman. They need food. They are, you know, poor. And he said, come. He gave him 30 rupees because uh, Indian rupees before. And he took him with him pearl diving. After one month, you know, you, you should be stay three months not to come back. My my father gets sick. And before, is, is no medicine, you know, we have three medicine. We have plant, you drink it, clean your stomach, we call it halul. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they have like uh, steel, they put in the fire, where it's, uh, they done all that, they read Quran in him. And my grandfather, you know, start to bring him back because they have the only uh, son. That's my father, we are 22 now. <laughs> he wow. has a big family, mashallah. <laughs> From my mother, 10. <laughs> and when he brought him back in Jabal Ali, where is the reserve now, suddenly he's good, and he can, you know, they, they, they said, stop here, we will dive here. It's a shallow water, and they brought only 400 uh, shells, because in pearl diving, 10,000 every day. And they're joking, they said, you know, the, pearl, the pearls, big pearls is coming, guns happen, come. So big pills like this. Now, when you open the big pills, you don't give to the captain. You put in your mouth, and you tell the captain to give you money because you are the lucky guy. And this guy, he couldn't speak because it's a big mm, like this. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandfather bring the stick to read Quran on him. He, he, have, he think he have genie <laughs> ghost. <you know? laughs> he said, no, I have something inside. <laughs> When he took it, you know, they came to Dubai and they sell it 200,000 rupees. They came to the Omani guy, the poor guy. He never dreamed with 100 rupees. They put 4,000 for him. He said, for whom this? He said, for you. He said, I'll be hungry. Hungry and Omani, rich, you know. Alhamdulillah, he went to Oman and bought the biggest uh, farm and he came rich. Until now, we are connecting with his family. And the good thing, they say, the Arhamum in Filar, the Arhamum in Fisama. It means take care about the poor people, God, He will sit. And that's why my grandfather gets the red big pills. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I've done a few panels in my time, but the bar <laughs> has been very, very highly set today. Very difficult to follow. But That's one minute, please. I want him to <laughs> sing with me because the pill diving is singing. You know, if you sing with me, it will be nice. Wa'alayhi wa'alayhi. Wa'alayhi wa'alayhi. Wa'alayhi wa'alayhi. I think they have future, huh? They can sing. <laughs> <laughs> you got crew members signing up left, right, and center. Um, Tiffany, let's move on to you, if we may, because, again, another great advocate for the principles that the, 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 the Major Ali has just been speaking about there. Explain to, to us all about just one of a number of roles that you have uh, in conservatorship here. I mean, 
the Possibilities Project, the Eco Edition. Tell us about what they try to achieve and whether those goals are being achieved. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, as Major Ali mentioned before, one of the greatest investments that countries can make is in educating the youth, in empowering youth to better shape their futures. Within the context of the modern world, we're very focused on environmental management, sustainability, eco-literacy, understanding that our nature and humanity are interconnected and interwoven, and we have a direct impact on our environment. So there are a number of remarkable initiatives in the region, but the one that I chose to contribute to and co-found with PDSI MIA and Envirotech International Group was the Possibilities Project. Now the Possibilities Project was initially established a year ago with the intention of providing a guidebook helping students to shape their futures, understanding what skills are required and what's important in the UAE so that we can move forward and build positive communities where we all are accountable for our actions. This year, I had the privilege of co-founding the Eco Edition or the Environmental Edition. And where this edition goes one step further is that we have brought together regional leadership, mentors, all on one platform, sharing their stories, sharing their journeys, so that the next generation can be empowered and engaged in our new sustainable future through quality education. A lot of that's been guided by the UN SDGs, the Sustainable um, Development Goals at the moment. Madhita, I want to get your thoughts, because we talked a lot about the UA, we talked a lot about the region as well. You take a very much more larger regional perspective as the CN Centre for Biodiversity. Tell us more about how, well, some of the projects, a, a, what the centre tries to achieve, but B, some of the projects that you're imparting to, to inspire the youth of today. All right. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, it's so hard to follow the so first two speakers. <laughs> But, um, well, the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity was established by 10 countries in Southeast Asia. And it was because of the recognition that the, the, the region has high biodiversity and uh, there's a need to protect it because it's part of the natural capital of the region. Uh, there's also a recognition of the uniqueness of the species that are found there. We have uh, the, of the 20, more around 24,000 uh, uh, known uh, major taxa, uh, around uh, you know 30 percent is mm. is, is um, found only in, in, in the region. So uh, th there was a need to to establish the center so that we can coordinate the actions uh, among the the countries. We are also interconnected. Uh, there may be oceans that separate us, but they don't actually separate us, they connect us. Mm. Um, because uh, species uh, migrate across the regions and even on land. And so that's the, the, the main role of the center is really to coordinate the actions across all the 10 countries and also to promote partnerships outside the regions. Mm. Um, we have the ASEAN Plus partnerships uh, in the, with with uh, other countries who are interested in, in working with the 10 uh, member states. Um, and uh, one of our uh, uh, pro banner programs are, is the ASEAN Heritage Park, mm. which is uh, the uh, protected areas that are cream of the crop of protected areas in the region. Um, and as of now, we have 50 ASEAN Heritage Parks, and there's a sharing of experiences ac across ASEAN Heritage Parks. Uh, we have both terrestrial and marine her uh, ASEAN heritage parks. And um, aside from that, we have the ASEAN Biodiverse Youth Biodiversity Program, where we engage the youth of ASEAN. Uh, we have, uh, of the total population of, of ASEAN, 33% 30 are, are, are 35 years old and, and below. Mm. And for ASEAN, there's around 213 million uh, youth that we can harness to help us to support uh, the, the biodiversity, nature protection in, in, in the region. And uh, we engage them not just uh, uh, formally in, 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 in the education sector, but also informally through our projects. Yeah. We invite them, we expose them to ASEAN Heritage Parks. 
uh, we create platforms for sharing experiences uh, with, with across the region of, of the youth. Uh, and then uh, we don't, we actually do, we actually promote mainstreaming as well. We don't just invite the youth who are working on the environment, but we want really to mainstream biodiversity in whatever career they choose. Uh, if they, you know, we have, we have youth who want to be bankers, we have youth who want to be uh, economists, uh, filmmakers, but what we want is really to, 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 uh, to tickle their interest so that you know, in whatever career they choose, they would think about nature and biodiversity yeah. as, they, you know, as, they, as they plan their, 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 um, their career forward. I want to stick with the youth element, if I may. I imagine who better to ask than you. I mean, we've, it, it, we've, we've heard how, obviously, uh, conservation runs deep in the veins, in the heart and the blood of Emiratis, of those in the region here. It is part of the heritage, a part of the background. It, it is, is the message continuing to younger generations here? And maybe you can just guide us through why you and your partners founded Somometa. Okay, so um, to the first part of that question, absolutely. We have now over the last five years when I was working both in Abu Dhabi and then for the federal government before yeah. founding Soma Mater, um, a lot of the programs involved um, really making sure all of that knowledge, both our own heritage as well as modern sort of understanding of conservation and biodiversity moves down right down to the primary school level. So, no, that's always been here. And actually, it's, it's an absolute honor for me to be on the panel with Major Ali because not too long ago, or maybe longer than I'd like to admit, I was right out of school standing with Major Ali in Jabal Ali, and he was showing me what was happening. And I was thinking, well, I'm not alone then in what I intend to do. <laughs> um, so, many, so many years later, um, after having spent five years at the federal government as advisor to Minister of Climate Change and Environment, I realized there was a reoccurring request coming to me specifically. In 2017-18, I built the primer for the food security strategy for yeah. the country, which then was handed over to the, the Minister for Food Security. Um, but that was in, an, in a unique perspective that I was looking at, okay, we as the UAE in this region are always leading agendas. We are always leading you know, new ground. Um, and I realized we were in a unique position to do that as well in terms of food security for the region. And after having done that work, the recurring request to me to help companies, help other people, other government entities to position themselves, to align themselves to the, not only the subject matter of food security, but I was the director for terrestrial biodiversity at the Environment Agency and how to bring themes like sustainability and biodiversity into the mainstay, and you mentioned the SDGs, mm. I realized there was, a, there was a space here for an entity that could really make food security and sustainability accessible, right? There are a lot of companies who will say sustainability and companies who want to be part of that agenda, want to be able to contribute to the economy and to the sustainability. But that knowledge sometimes is not as easy to find and more so, what is the right solution of the many that exist now globally? And we were having a conversation before this panel where what we're trying to do is really drive that, that change in the private sector as well as support government and policymakers to say we need to build that narrative out of our own context, mm. not borrow ideas from abroad alone. And the idea of only taking ideas from outside, I mean, Major Ali's just explained how it is in our blood and in our veins to be sustainable. There was a time where we didn't survive unless we relied and cooperated with the environment. So why is that such a strange idea today? Yeah. And with all the growth today, what Soma Mata is trying to do is not only create more awareness and accessibility for the private sector or governments of the MENA region, but also to be able to enable it and really get down to executing on the sustainable development goals and not just have them as referenced in panels and discussions. So and that's ultimately what we're trying to do here, is trying to get into the action of execution. So in your opinion, and again, I, I appreciate that we've got so many different perspectives here, but all sort of funneling towards um, the world that we live in and climate change as a whole, and be it food security or, or, or otherwise. I mean, has 
the pandemic, has COVID-19 been a distraction away from we were actually getting places before COVID-19, the message was getting across, or has it helped to accelerate the message of need of change? Yeah, well, I started my consultancy in the middle of 2020. <laughs> so that was, that if there was ever a moment to take stark, you know, really just look at the situation. In 2020, everybody's world was turned upside down. My wife sometimes is really guilty. She said she was secretly asking for a break and got over-delivered, but <laughs> that's what you'll have, right? Ultimately, what it's done is where people assumed food would always be on the table and the supermarkets would be full and they could go for a walk every day. That was overnight or over a few months starting to change dramatically and it threw and cast very strong light on the things that we've been taking for granted in our environment and in the economy and how the world actually works. And it made very clear that, well, if we don't take care of it, it could all just disappear. And with that signal, and that was really what me and my partner decided, look, we need to get out there and start doing this work because we don't have all that much time, according to, you know, the the different scientists around the world. There ultimately needs to be a change, and I'm not one to wait for somebody else to be the solution. I want to come in yeah. and be part of that solution. And so we, we got to work, and it was started with simply writing white papers and really being able to communicate to leaders, and then people started calling, people started asking, how do we do this, can you help us, and now we're, we're really busy. <laughs> I guess. So with, with what happened in 2020 and Corona, Really, it's just woken everybody up. Yeah. And now we're all scrambling to execute. And this is what we're here to help with. So, Teresa, let's throw it over to you. Because, again, I mean, one thing that we learned from the pandemic was a sense of isolation. You know, a lot of countries were forced to close borders and look after their own. No one in, no one out. Let's sort this one out ourselves. When you've got an organization that takes into account the thoughts of numerous different nations in a region... How do you get them to get around the table and work together to a common practice? Uh, well, it was challenging at first, but, uh, the, but we were able to adapt uh, through uh, the digital platforms. Mm. Uh, we were able to um, uh, hold meetings, uh, webinars, and uh, through, through digital platforms. And uh, we have focal points on in each countries and we were able to provide them more responsibilities and, and more accountabilities and and so it really became a, a, a group effort among among the ten countries and um, it it also uh, was an opportunity for us to re-examine our relationship with nature as we were all alone in our homes mm. uh, and it was a sort of anthropos as well and uh, you know when the animals the birds started coming back. You start, <laughs> wow, you appreciating the, 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 the nature around you. And um, I think it was an eye-opener as well for a lot of uh, the private sectors because in, in, during that time, uh, you know, their, their economies were affected. And then studies were also, you know, the, the scientists also uh, were able to uh, determine that there are still 1.7 million viruses in mammals and birds. Uh, out there, and like 600 to 600 to 800 thousand can still infect people, mm. and so the recovery should not just be immediate. Sh we should also think about medium term to long term recovery, which will take into account nature and biodiversity. Yeah, and, and, and Tiffany, just to pick up on that point as well, because I mean, the title of this one again it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, how many companies, how many? Seven-year-old kids really understand SDGs these days at the moment, you know, and however many, 17, that we're all meant to follow and know each every, everyone individually. Um, is there now that greater urgency that we're talking about? And to follow up on that, are there higher stakes at play here if we do not act now? So if we have a look at the United Nations SDGs, and as you said, there are 17 different focal areas, all equally important in their magnitude and gravitas, um, especially on emerging economies as well as developed economies, which we have here. The one STG that um, kind of embodies what we are looking to achieve following on from the COVID-19 pandemic is partnerships mm. for the goals. Drawing together 
global partnerships? How do we provide innovative education? How do we liberate our students who are at home and have been at home for months? How do we engage them in new topics, provide new skills, so that when we are appreciative of our environments and when we are able to leave the house again, we have the skills to make a meaningful difference within our communities. So there really is that urgency to enhance um, our educational systems, as has been shared by uh, my fellow panelists, to really focus on the environment and how do we bring our youth back together, back to the environment, how do we form long-lasting partnerships so that we can um, engage our youth moving forward for our sustainable future. So to that end, Major Ali, I mean, you started by very eloquently talking to us about, you know, the, the need for change, not just today, but has been throughout your entire career and all the work that you've done here. Is the message getting across to younger generations here at the moment that we, uh, with regards to the importance of biodiversity, or are they taking it for granted? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Majid. Majid is a great guy, he's our sheikh. And when he came to me before more than 15 years, I want to catch him <laughs> and wait him to stay with me. <laughs> but I want to be environment to come because he will be minister now. <laughs> uh, same like uh, Maryam. Maryam, mashallah, she stay with me. Maryam Harib, she's the minister of climate change, uh, five years. And I take care about her, you know, and she's sitting with me one time and she said, I'll be a minister. I said, why not? <laughs> This is <laughs> our country, if you have you know, knowledge, and you have, why not? Now, mashallah, she's uh, for uh, you know, uh, what's happening with coffee. Uh, you know, it's a, for me, it's really different. You know, I went to the island and started you know, taking care about the turtle in Sirvanair Island. Uh, before, you know, we have like 300, uh, you know, 200. And, and when we have this problem, you know, I stay four months there. We have 410 nests, I mean, uh, turtle nests, this is which is good for us, you know. Uh, if you come to Dubai also in uh, Jabal Ali, we have uh, more turtle, you know, because we have like 30, 35. Now, mashallah, we have uh, 60 nests. Mm. Uh, it means, you know, this is something shock for the people to understand, you know, the education and to take care about the uh, nature is very important. and. Very important also, you know, uh, this knowledge should be good, you know, to the university and also to the school. This is what we do, you know, we have uh, always uh, classes and they come to the uh, our reserve and, you know, uh, play with the nature, see the nature. And this is one of the important messages come to us, really, how we, we should be uh, stuck with the nature. Mm. And this is what happened from our grandfather and our grandmother, you know. Inshallah, uh, you know, I wrote a book, my book, they call it Sardan. It's about the whole uh, life, more than 500 years, because my family uh, is a pill diving from long uh, uh, distance. And when we find this big wells, we bought the biggest post, boat. And this boat, we start trading. And the trading, they go to Mesendam, to uh, take, you know, uh, dry fish, and they go to Basra to give them, you know, the dry fish and load uh, dates. They come to Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and go to Pakistan, Karachi, Bombay, until Calicut. Now, this journey is very important because this is how we live. And when Second War come, you know, that's we like the Indian and the English, because, you know, in Second War, people dying here, the English start bringing food, you know, to the people here, which is something really we, uh, happy with it and my grandfather decided to go to India to bring food and the first Indian come to Dubai they call him uh, Tata Ratan this is the first India and he's friend of my grandfather and he told him if you go to uh, Bombay nobody's going to give you food because it's limited second war you know he, he gave him letter for the Maharaja Maharaja is the sheikh big sheikh there in uh, in India when he started in Muscat the uh, the British, they, they caught him and said, where do you go? He said, we go to Bombay. He said, no, the submarine is there, German. Any boat cross, it will hit. He came out and he told his, my father, let's go. Wakal Allah, he said, wait, Wakal Allah. 
<laughs> a submarine there. He said, okay, now we have uh, our flag, uh, white and red. He took the flag and he put pearl diving flag. And the submarine let them go. <laughs> 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 they arrived to India and they went, you know, to the Maharaja, this big guy, when he saw the letter from Ratan, he filled our boat with 7,000 basmati and food and everything. Now, when they fill their boat, they go back and the submarine is there now. <laughs> they cover everything and they put the same flag and they, uh, you know, when they come to, uh, you know, Hormuz, here we have problem because people, they think genie is there. You know, they have a mountain and this is genie. <laughs> they call it Salama. If you don't throw food for her, you cannot enter. Yeah. This is the, you know, uh, how they think. When they come close, you know, the wind is not strong like the current. And they couldn't. And one of the Omani guys said, throw food, you will go. They throw food and they come inside, <laughs> which by <laughs> chance, you know. <laughs> and they came here and they give the food free for everybody. And this is some amazing thing how our communication, you know, with these guys. Now, inshallah, my journey with my book is going around again to retain the good for these people, you know, in India, in, uh, in Africa, in, in many parts. And thank you very much. No, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you for continuing that journey. Uh, right, we are running short on time, but not a, we have got plenty of time to get through loads of questions coming through. So let's do some quick-fire questions, some individual questions coming through from uh, our city viewers. Thank you very much indeed to the LB ABLF City crew. Uh, we've got one from Wales for you, Tiffany, all the way from Wales. Uh, uh, Georgia is from Wales, asks, uh, please can you ask Dr. Tiffany, uh, what would be your tips uh, for young adults who want to make a concrete difference to the discussions around biodiversity? That is a really remarkable question, and it has so many different elements to address. Um, the one thing that I will say is that within different regions, whether it's the United Arab Emirates or Wales, whether it's under the governance of the United Nations and the SDGs, there are a number of different initiatives and forums where students can be engaged where their voices and concerns can be heard, and where they can engage in educational programs that can help them to make meaningful contributions to their future. Um, all of these resources exist, they are accessible online, and this is the kind of information that we hope to showcase in initiatives, like the Possibilities Project. If you don't know where to begin, how do you begin? Um, you know, so it's so important that fellow panelists as well as regional leadership and environmental management share these opportunities and these stories so that sh students can shape their futures. Appreciate that one. We've got one for Dr. Teresa as well. Question for Dr. Teresa Lim. The balance between... Oh, this is from Sammy. Uh, Sammy's in Singapore. Thank you, Sammy, uh, over in Singapore. Thanks for being in touch. Saying the balance between development and saving the environment is the big challenge. Uh, especially in many Asian countries at the moment. How can that balance be achieved? Uh, I mentioned mainstreaming biodiversity, and it doesn't have to be conservation or development because they can coexist if you know how to manage your resources well so that you, as you progress, as you develop, then you, you also protect the environment. Of course, it is different. It depends on the private sector. It depends on your business, how you want to do it. Uh, for example, uh, for agriculture, there would be a different. Th there would be different opportunities, and there would be different ways on how to do it. Uh, but the important thing is there's an awareness among the private sector, among the businesses, that we should no longer uh, do a. You know, it should no longer be business as usual. Right. Uh, with the with the pandemic, they have realized. Well, uh, we hope that you know that more businesses would realize that uh, biodiversity should not just be part of their CSR, but it should already be part of their business models. Because whatever happens to nature, to biodiversity, will eventually affect their business. Mm. And that's how we want to keep everybody aware and we want to work with the private sector, perhaps uh, to learn from each yeah. other as yeah. well yeah. on how to be able to, to, to do it so that they, that they become our partners in conservation and 
you know, strike that balance. Well, that's a, a really good point, and it's one that I'm going to uh, ask Manager to pick up on, because I've got a question here that from Jimmy. Jimmy's been in touch from the Philippines. Very global audience today. Thank you very much indeed, Jimmy. Uh, saying, uh, question for Kelly. So, okay, so yes, young people like myself are really engaged with the environment in every way I can be. But question is, how can we as individuals make a concrete difference to make big corporations, big business, sit up and take notice? I, I love that question, Jimmy, because ultimately everybody has to understand that you are the ones who can vote. You vote with your dollars, you vote with your dirhams, you are their customers. And we've seen en enough where a group of people come together and say, okay, we want to see this. Every business has it in their interest to listen to their customers and deliver, especially in a day where we are so connected globally and we're all on social media. The, the ability simply to access information in so many different ways, barring some misinformation, but the idea is you can choose and the awareness for consumers today is so much higher. Consumers want to make sure that every business they buy from is more conscious of the environment, understands that they have strong ESG pillars, that's environment, social, and governance pillars. They want to support companies that have the same ethos and the same values as themselves. And as that becomes more aware and more transparent, so does where the business goes. And at some point, businesses are either going to have to listen to their customers or chase them. It's, it's one or the other. So Jimmy, you and your friends and whoever is a customer, can choose whether you buy from this farm or that farm, this company or that company. And it may seem like very little, but every dollar counts. Mm. Um, listen, we've given a uh, floor to the ABLF city. What about the local city down here as well? Uh, any questions? Yeah, I've got a question at the back there. Yes, madam. You know what, that's the perfect question to wrap things up with as well, because we can go down the panel for a little bit of advice. What changes uh, can we make uh, for a day-to-day -day basis to make a change? I'll start, if you guys don't mind. Yeah, um, my first advice to any change, um, there are so many we can make, but I would advise that you make small incremental changes so they become habits and you're not overwhelmed with changing how the house works. It started in our house with first segregating waste to say, okay, we're not just throwing everything in the bin. Let's at least do our part to separate. And then where you understand you can make changes. So we don't buy bottled water anymore. We don't buy um, things that are overly packaged. We buy loose fruit. But these have been incremental changes. They will stick longer. Everybody in the house can get behind them. Um, there's a long list. Pick what's easiest for you. But everything will compound in that sense. So start somewhere and just get everybody to at least do 30 days of separating the waste and then move on to the next one. And you can even make a list of, we want to tackle this, we want to tackle that. Appreciate those thoughts. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Teresa, let's have a go to you. Well, uh, what more can I say? <laughs> 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 yes, but um, I think being aware of uh, the, the impacts of your choices uh, would be very good because then you will be able to, to choose what is better for your future or, or better for the present as well. Uh, the, the pandemic has uh, provided a lot of challenges, especially on waste disposal. Uh, but, you know, if we are conscious and if it becomes, you know, in internalized on how to be able to, you know, handle the waste, segregate it, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, if that's, that's where you can start. I well, appreciate your thoughts. And thank you so much indeed for being with us as well and sharing your opinions throughout. Dr. Tiffany, we turn to you. What's next on the hit list? Um, as we move further down the line, I find <laughs> it quite difficult. <laughs> um, however, one thing that I will say is that specifically within the UAE, there are a number of regional initiatives. If you are familiar with the regional initiatives, just by having a look, whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, in the newspaper, um, for example, there is a one billion tree planting initiative that is occurring in the UAE at this very point in time. Touching on what my fellow panelists said, you know, through purchases with organizations that are aligned with this initiative, your purchase actually plants a tree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so these are ways that you can make meaningful differences by just going to the supermarkets or by going to Carrefour. 
Um, you know, and further to that, to touch on what you said, Doctor, is that by having this awareness of what occurs and the different initiatives that we have in the region, you have the capability of enforcing, is perhaps a strong word, but in shaping our future, making proactive change today. Tiffany, thank you so much indeed for being with us. Um, uh, we started uh, with the thoughts of Major Ali, and we will finish with the thoughts of uh, what I think you'll all appreciate is that he is the true godfather of conservatism here and, uh, for, and, and ecology. So, uh, Major Ali, the floor is yours, sir. What do we do? Thank you. <laughs> you know, for me, it's really different. You know, we are a uh, Miji. If somebody makes a mistake, we say, we love you. It's not allowed shouting. It's not allowed to say any bad word. Only that's happened because when Scotch lady, she worked with me, and she lost equipment. And she came crying. She told the girl, Major Ali is going to kill me. I cuddle her, and I said, I love you. Let's and find it, and we find it. Uh, love is very important. I, I think this is very important word. And if we love each other, I think we will settle all our problem. And I have also something for everybody. If you lose your job, come to it to me. I take you build. I'll take you build and get you come rich. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much. He's recruiting Thank crew. You. He's recruiting for the company. Everyone's coming on board. Major Ali, thank you so much indeed. In fact, thanks to all four of our panelists. Please put your hands together for our four panelists uh, for their thoughts. That concludes uh, our ABLF Talks uh, session for today down here in Dubai. So big thanks to all four of our panelists. Thank you very much indeed to all of those that have turned out here uh, at uh, Expo 2020 Dubai, all our friends at Dubai Cares as well for housing us over the course of the last couple of hours, and of course to uh, all of our viewers on the ABLF City uh, uh, website and platform. Over 11,000 have logged in uh, for proceedings today, so thank you so much indeed for showing your support from all over the globe. Do stay uh, up to date with all the latest you can tweet at ABLF. We'll find out more on Instagram and LinkedIn. We'll update you with, for, with future uh, talks and future events on there. But for now, from all the team here at Expo 2020 Dubai, which you've got to visit, all right, all of you out there, come on over and visit. Please do. Uh, the doors are open. The gates are open. Uh, but for now, from all the team down here, good afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>